नमस्ते एंड वेलकम टू दिस स्पेशल लाइव स्ट्रीम ऑन द भारत वार्ता पॉडकास्ट आई एम युअर होस्ट फॉर द डे श्रीवत्सा सुबर्ण टुडे वील बी टॉकिंग टू श्री शक्ति सिन्हा जी अबाउट हिज बुक वाजपेयी द इयर्स दैट चेंज इंडिया एंड द रोल ऑफ श्री अटल बिहारी वाजपेयी जी इन चेंजिंग द कोर्स ऑफ इंडिया थ्रू हिज रिफॉर्म्स न्यूक्लियर टेस्ट एंड हिज वेरियस अदर कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन Uh, Shakti Sinha ji first got to know Vajpayee ji in 1980 and worked with him closely for more than 3 years in the 90s uh, as secretary to the leader of the opposition and also his private secretary he was he has been the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library he is a distinguished fellow at the Indian Foundation and is currently serving as the honorary director of the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Policy Research and international studies uh, ms university vadodara uh, shakti ji welcome to bharat varta great to have you here thank you great to be here shivasa great to be looking forward to this conversation thank you uh, i also have with me rajiv mantri uh, who will be a discussant on this episode uh, rajiv is an author and investor who you have heard on multiple episodes across policy and politics on bharat varta Uh, including our special uh, episode on the good governance day on uh, atal bihari vajpayee ji's birthday uh, so Thank rajiv you for uh, great great uh, welcome rajiv uh, so rajiv anything you are specifically excited about you know talking to uh, shakti ji before we so start it's fabulous to have the opportunity to uh, raise questions with someone who's worked so closely uh, with one of the most beloved prime ministers of india so uh, i am really looking forward to this interaction and i am sure many of the audience members are too absolutely i am also looking forward to this interaction uh, so shakti ji uh, to start off you know the subtitle of your book is you know the years that changed india so i have two questions uh, here first is uh, can you talk about you know why you wrote this book Uh, covering these three three and a half years of your association with Vajpayee ji, and why do you believe that Vajpayee ji's PM ship uh, changed India? Uh, I think we've lost. I think uh, he's Shakti ji is disconnected. Yeah, we we'll just wait for him to join back. so shakti sena ji uh, i'll start off with a with a question on you know why did you write this book and uh, the subtitle of the book is the years that changed india so right. can you elaborate on you know the reasons why you think uh, vajpayee ji's pm ship uh, changed india happy to say was this is a a lot of people ask me that uh, but if i tell you the second question immediately you will lose all interest in the book because that's exactly what the book is all about but no i'm seriously speaking one because i thought and i was convinced reading mainstream media that suddenly the figure of vajpayee that period of his rule was being romanticized in a manner which to me was jarring if i remember those days they were very difficult days 
the language used against Mr. Vajpayee and his government by his opponents, not just political opponents, but ideological opponents in the media, in academia, was extremely harsh, brutal, anti-minority, fascism, saffronization, you name it, the words were being bandied about in those days. And now you write that, oh, he was such a great man, 25, we all loved him. Well, if you loved him, where were you those days? I didn't see you anywhere. And I, I've quoted in the back the same people to today you realize him. I've just quoted what they wrote in different media then. So I thought the need, one was that need. Second, as a student of history, I found it amazing that in some ways we don't too much care about recent contemporary history, right? Well, the fact of the matter is India is a young country. It's a country which is changing very fast, changing substantially. You know, growing up in the 60s, between the 60s and 1998, the changes were incremental, snail space, glacial. 98 to now, if I see now as an example, completely new India for the good, for the better. Yes, we have our watts, we have our chaos, but compared to what I saw earlier in India, I think need to portray the pictures are important. Why do I call the years that changed India? I've listed five things in the book coherently, which tries to explain how those five specific steps. One, the first genuine non-Congress government in Indian history, generally non-Congress government. It had one or two people who had worked in the Congress, that is it. Unlike the Janta Party or Chandra Shekhar or VP Singh, who are lifelong congressmen, this was not a Congress government. And it faced a lot of opposition, tremendous amount, which I just mentioned. Two, cross the nuclear threshold, which would have been done much long, long ago. It was done. Third, reaching out to Pakistan then. First, to demonstrate this hyphenation is bad, India, Pak. Second, you, know, you can't be a great power if your own neighborhood is unsettled and you try to settle your neighborhood in different ways. Whether it's as a surgical strikes or through peace, some way you have to settle your neighborhood. So the outreach to Pakistan culminating in Lahore, very important. Third, completely changing Indian thinking about the world by saying that USA and India are natural allies. Ally is a word even today people share, oh, no, no, partners, okay, how can you say ally? Ally. No, ally does not mean subordination. Ally meant partners who have convergence of interest, convergence of values, and who in the changing world must work with each other. And the lastly was our ability in the Kargil war to conduct it as a responsible nuclear weapon state, but without compromising our security and our ability for the first time to convince the world that it is the Pakistan which is the aggressor don't apply the same standards to both of us. Get them out first, then we we'll talk. So I think these are the five things that I think happened, which really have changed the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at the world, and critically the way the world looks at us. Uh, Rajiv, uh, I think you've also mentioned multiple times about Vajpayee's role as a reformer and that you know period being something that truly changed India. Uh, can you also share your uh, views on that? So I have said this uh, before, uh, Shrivatsa, that uh, I think the Vajpayee contribution was transforming India from a frontier market to an emerging market. So if you go back to the 97-98 period, uh, the way India was viewed that time, and then you know six years later, after sort of uh, a government which widened, deepened economic reforms in all directions, uh, which also sort of, as uh, uh, Shakti ji was pointing out, in foreign policy, the changes that were brought. So all put together, it transformed the standing of the country. What was seen as kind of a international backwater, uh, I think at the end of that uh, six year period came to be a force to reckon with. And, and we saw uh, that during the first term of the UPA government, uh, when, when you know India was being viewed in a very different light for, for that uh, five, six year period, till such time as the, till, till such time that the scams broke out of the UPA. Yeah. If I can just chip in for a moment, sure, you know, sure. I, I agree with Rajiv completely. My book is limited to the period 98, 99. So while I've talked about the highway program, I've talked about the changes in telecom. Yeah. Yes. I could not really focus on yes. the economy because Vajpayee didn't get enough oxygen to do economic yeah. reforms. 
which he got post 99 election okay. yeah. so therefore actually I think Rajiv's point is complements what i'm saying and it's not that why did i ignore economics you know no no sure uh, i i mean you actually but the, but the NTP, put in a NTP lot NTP of the in the highway uh, program was seeded actually uh, yeah. in that period yeah so, absolutely so i think shakti sir mentions that the realization came later but the, uh, those big ideas absolutely. the kind of big absolutely. thinking so i remember one of the uh, most amazing speeches which we also quoted in our book a new idea of india i think one of the most amazing speeches any prime minister has given was a 1998 speech that uh, vajpayee ji gave at cii yeah yeah so <laughs> uh, no, that my, was an aspirational speech you know, that was a speech was an aspirational speech you know but yes mm-hmm. it was a fresh thinking yeah okay yes right uh so that's a great note to start on uh, so shakti sinha ji uh, what was your uh, personal experience uh, working in the pmo with uh, vajpayee ji and i think uh, rajiv has uh, uh, another question uh, related to that okay sir you know of course i joined him officially in his office 96 no, government and, i am i remember so you were yeah please go ahead rajiv please So, uh, please carry on. I'll I'll, I'll uh, ask after you are completing. Okay. No, no problem. No problem. I, one, I don't mind being interrupted if it adds to the conversation. If it's a scoring debating point, that's another matter. But if it adds to the conversation, I don't mind being interrupted. You know. So I did join him in '96 in the very short period, but then the government fell, so it didn't really matter. Then I worked with him in opposition, and that was a learning experience. I've described in the book how this is a very small office. Yeah. i'm a relatively senior ias officer and here i'm literally everything in the office other than making the tea we have people for that but you know drafting all the letters reading all the reading all the letters drafting his replies doing research for him doing a lot of research for him making his speeches so it was you know so we developed a kind of different kind of an equation and then he becomes prime minister again properly uh, one advantage of work with vajpay is the disadvantage also the advantage was that he gave you a very open hand to work on you know he won't tell you in advance this is what i want to know you know so you do your research and come up with your finding he may like it he may not like a speech i wrote for him for the center for science and environment release of a book on water and uh, he rejected four drafts he told me ki aap aise likh rahe hain you know you wrote a speech this is an essay you know now obviously for a person like me decent academic background in the civil service you are used to thinking in a very formal kind of a way and you know you you learn so much and later when i helped him with the budget speech when he replied to the budget of 1997 the so called dream budget you could see the difference you know if we had worked out our equation the disadvantage was again the same that he was a silent person he wouldn't tell you too much so you had to literally guess you know so but yes he respected people he never bothered about hierarchy this is a secretary government of india this is a deputy secretary government of india is 30 years difference in but he was very open to everybody you know so that made it very very easy in that sense to work with him but not a social person quiet person very good listener which can be dangerous for people like me who talk a lot you know so you really care for what you speak but i'm more interested rajiv i know you feel embarrassed but don't feel embarrassed you were right to interrupt me please tell me what you were thinking then i'm so sorry actually sometimes there is a lag in the video which is why i think you know i was saying something and then i didn't know you had already started speaking that's why it happened no i was only saying sir uh, you had written this op-ed in 2018 uh, talking about uh, vajpayee ji's work ethic yeah. and uh, in the i think it was in the hindustan times you had mentioned how meticulously he used to work even when he was obviously uh, the leader of the country yeah so if you can just talk about that i think that will be very interesting lovely thanks for thanks for reminding me with my graying hair whitening of hair my memory is not as good you know why i found this out to us that contrary to the popular perception he was a very hard working person you know his love was foreign policy to be fair he never hid the fact so foreign policy dignitaries come to meet him so the foreign ministry prepares what is called a brief what a history of relationship with them what are the issues this seems very simple right but the brief actually run into 150 200 250 pages sometimes even that's an extreme case but briefs are normally thick documents what a distortion but anyway <laughs> and he to meticulously read it question people on that remember things 
So, you know, so while his normal memory was failing, okay, he would mix up names and all, which is fine. But on critical issues, I never once saw him make a mistake. Then even on, impo- not normal speeches, normal speeches, he didn't need effort. People mistook what I wrote. But on important speeches, he used to really work hard. This I saw him when he was in the opposition. He used to read, he used to write, he used to read, he used to write. So he had 50, 30, 40 pages where scribbled things, written, 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 written. And he was not... I think in his mind, he was working it out. So when he used to finally speak, he didn't need these pieces of paper, but he spent hours preparing for it. So, you know, he got your priorities right. He was clear, economics is not his strength. He was prepared to be guided by others, but his core feeling was of that of a classical liberal. The government should not be in business. The government's job is to not just remove obstacles, but smoothen things out, but don't get involved in business. That was his essential at heart kind of a philosophy, you know, but yes. And he's to work long hours. You no, know, like, okay, one of example, you know, PM address to the nation. So you, you spent days preparing the speech, correction, recorrection, editing, ed- and then the recording starts. Now in a 20 minute speech, you will slip up somewhere. And ed- editing skills were not so good those days, right? You could see through it. So you would start the recording once again from scratch. Three times, four times, five times, which meant that he realized that if this is essential, I have to do what I have to do. You know? So that's what I meant by, contrary to the popular impression of being a laid back person, not on key issues, not at all. That's amazing that, to know. No, and also, also, you know, his, his magical oratory, his terrific sort of uh, the way he would summon facts in his speech, you know, there was effort behind that actually. That is very. Uh, very good to know, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, it, it's been captured in a, in a lot of detail in the book. Uh, I've, I've just read the book and, you know, I would encourage everyone to buy a copy and read the book. It's, it's a fascinating read. Uh, so, Shakti Sinaji, uh, moving on, uh, you know, when Vajpayee Ji first came to power in 96, it was for 13 days, the BJP had only two allies, uh, Samta Party and Shiv Sena. From there, uh, in 98, when he formed the government, uh, the NDA had 13 parties in all. So, and a lot of it had to do with Vajpayee Ji being, you know, seen as the uh, leader of, of the uh, NDA. Uh, so, what was his role and can you just talk us through, uh, you know, how some of those alliances uh, came about? Thank you, Shivasa. I think that requires actually a book by itself. But if you can see me right now, this is the book that Shivasa just mentioned. Please go ahead and buy it. It will not really make me very happy, as it should. But actually, seriously, I'm not being, I'm not being uh, falsely, I'm sounding arrogant. I'm not sounding arrogant. But I think I've tried my best to capture that period in a great amount yeah. of detail. Absolutely. Now, you know, when the government of 96 fell, it had to fall. And then everybody got together to prevent the BJP effectively, other than the uh, Akalis, who by then moved closer to the BJP. So he immediately got a third ally in the Akalis. Okay. Now, UF government had to fail because the Congress could never allow a non-Congress government to succeed. And I've written it frankly that I personally thought, Vajpayee actually thought that Devgad was actually doing a pretty, pretty decent job of being prime minister, you know, despite the political opposition. He said, no, he was, you know, appreciative of it. But the way that the Vegoda government was brought down, the way Gujarat government was not allowed to function, a lot of parties realized that they would have to rethink their strategies. Now, the Janta Dal was a party falling apart. Hegde had been kicked out by Devagoda and Lalu, so he formed his own Lok Shakti. Naturally, it came towards the BJP. Naveen Patnaik realized that the, once Vijay Patnaik passed away and Naveen was brought in, he then realized that this would not hold in Odisha. He would need a new setup in Odisha, unencumbered by the Lalu Yadavs and the Chad Yadavs of the world. He came out from this party. Obviously, he wanted also to have some national linkages. So BJP became a natural ally kind of a thing. And in Tamil Nadu also, with the jockeying going on, the DMK firmly on one side. It was easier for the BJP then to establish good links with the ADM can form the alliance. So now, at, then finally at the end, and Trinamool was formed, after Mamta broke up with the Congress party, she was very upset that the Congress did not give her importance. That in a Congress meeting in Cal- in Howrah, I think, she was not treated well. She walks out. People were very excited. And then Manishankar Ayer was praising her a lot. And then she joins the BJP. 
Vajpayee's ability not to have a prior prejudgmental kind of a thing enabled these people to feel more comfortable with him, because at that stage I think ideology had to be partly put on the side, and the need to get together and form a government was more important. And Vajpayee, in that sense, represented a natural kind of a figure whose strength and popularity lay beyond the party. So at that stage, the BJP then was a small party. It was growing very rapidly, but for it to reach any major figure would require somebody like Vajpayee to carry it further. And that's why this enabled all these other parties: the Lok Shaktis, the ADMK, the PMK, the MDMK, the Biju Janata Dal, and the Trinamool then to come together. Shiv Sena had already joined you. Samta was there. So that enabled you to really, and Shiv Sena, of course. So that was a very big help for them that Vajpayee was leading it because he had a larger acceptability. Great. Uh, so moving on, uh, Shakti ji, uh, you know, India conducted the nuclear tests in nineteen ninety eight on May eleventh, which I read also happens to be your birthday. So we had uh, Operation Shakti on uh, your birthday. Uh, in your book, uh, you have covered the events leading up to the event in great detail, uh, right? So can you just talk us through, you know, what went on before the nuclear tests and, you know, the challenges that we faced through in the aftermath and how yeah. uh, Vajpayee ji dealt with it? Uh, see, one thing was clear and it surprised me. And I've written in the book. Vajpayee was committed to India going nuclear for 30 years. He yeah. never. You talked about bringing all these parties together. So when they came together and formed the national agenda of governance in March of 1998, BJP dropped Ram Janamhumi, dropped Article 370, dropped Uniform Civil Code. What did it not drop? The bomb. It clearly said India will exercise the nuclear option. So I mean. If you are not reading at what is written, you're reading what's written on your mind, you're bound to go wrong. What we was committed to testing, I'm surprised that people didn't expect it to happen. You know, yes, it obviously required secrecy, which was done, and which I need not go into detail. But the fact is that what amazed me was post the test, I mean, we were treated worse than North Korea is treated now, worse than Iran was treated, but Iran was openly violating it, the NPT, having signed the NPT, right? I mean, the kind of international sanctions put on us, language used against us, are people being sent back? And even in Pakistan tests, you condemn Pakistan, but say Pakistan tested because India tested. But if Pakistan did not have a nuclear weapons program, could it start from scratch and test in 18 days? Obviously not. And yet nobody was prepared. But we kept saying our test is not Pakistan focused. Our test is essentially because of a larger environment in which we live. Even today, China borders us. China does not border the United States of America. China does not border Germany or Britain or France. It borders us. So we faced a peculiar Pakistani, Chinese, nuclear and missile cooperation going back a long time. China was in operation of our territory. Things were improving, but no, China was still continuing its nuclear and missile cooperation with Pakistan. And we needed to test to demonstrate that we were prepared to stand up, to validate designs which are 30 years old. There were nuclear sanctions in 74. We had been cut off from the world. We needed to know whether our computer simulations would actually work on the ground. So India had to test. We paid a very, very steep diplomatic and financial price for it in the short term. But the and at that moment, the kind of domestic pressure the Vajpayee government faced from the opposition, from the media, the lampooning, the sarcasm. Uh, I think it was a CPM leader who said, oh, now you have the bomb, go, sort out the Kashmir terrorist. I mean, you know, I mean, like, I mean, it's not just sarcasm, it is that kind of dripping sarcasm, you know, constant attacks, government which was skating on thin ice and yet to stand firm and work through the sanctions, engage with America, engage with Russia, engage with France, send a delegation even to Japan to explain, we know you're hurt by our test, but please understand what we are facing. So, you know, I thought that was very well done, underappreciated. I hope that after reading my chapter on that, some people will take interest in trying to find out more 
and because it does deserve to me it does deserve a bigger much bigger coverage than what is happening in contemporary world you know? uh rajiv any any thoughts anything you would want to add on that no so uh, just on the point of india facing that opprobrium actually from the rest of the world yeah. so in a way uh, would it be fair to say that uh, facing that kind of external pressure uh, created space for domestic reforms uh, <laughs> that's a good one i didn't think of that very much we did we no okay let me put it that way we realized that we needed a stronger economy one thing was very very clear that india needed a much bigger economy a much stronger economy but you know we were still people don't understand it we were a very small economy in 1998 yes, yes. i mean if people yeah. don't remember that you know yes i mean spain was a bigger economy than you in 1998 italy was a bigger economy than you in 1998 Fortunately, Greece was smaller. You know, I mean, you were down there. You were nobody. What was no, the nowhere actually? Yes, we were nowhere. Your exports, your exports were something like fifty billion dollars. Fifty billion dollars was your exports. So you know, you were you were nobody in the world. And the realization, therefore, and therefore the highway project, the telecom, and the subsequent privatization—not disinvestment, but privatization. You know, I mean, that did come out of the field that we needed to be big. But I think at that moment, handling was so difficult. Handling the overwhelm from the world. I mean, see the language. The Australians use the language which even Tim Payne on the cricket field would be embarrassed about using, and they were using it officially. You know, so it was. And I mean, all your loans, your grants, everything in between frozen. Access to the world was frozen, and yet many people understood India needed to test. Thank God, India has tested, and ultimately, that constituency in the West. which was able then to broaden itself and our efforts which came together that really helped change the narrative but for that we we'll also have to thank pakistan's pakistan's criminality in kargil for actually enabling the world to see us differently That's right uh so uh, i i had a follow up question uh, on that in the sense that there was this uh, pressure from you know the external world uh and it was not like you know the coalition partners were very friendly uh and you covered that extensively in your book uh, about you know constant demands being made to dismiss uh, chief ministers from the oppo- uh, you know opposing parties and so on uh and you know vajpayee ji came through all that and he at least laid the seeds you know for reform which he carried forward in in the uh, in his next term yes. uh so h- how did he uh, you know handle that uh, if you could just talk us through that it would be great well i think with a great amount of patience a strong amount of realism in it and he by publicly acknowledging that you know states have frustrations and we need to understand their frustrations you know and if you spend enough time talking to them and listening to many of the states you realize that uh, they may ask for big things but to do three small things they happy with that as a starter you know it's like a, a child asking for needing something small ask for thing very big parents say okay take this small thing and be happy with that so this small thing is what you wanted in any case now dispersion of state governments was difficult impossible and actually in bihar it was not just the samta party then but also section of the bjp which wanted the state government dismissed including the then finance minister shamsina he wanted to dismiss yeah, yeah. so dismissal is not going to work but sanctioning of railway projects in uh, west bengal is an example many concessions to chandrababu naidu who actually got a very good press for actually being an ally as difficult as anybody else yeah. but he got a very good press for it for which you must give him credit for you know so i think a large amount of patience and frankly understanding your weak position i only have 160 mps i need at least 112 others and therefore you have to make compromises to quote our present prime minister narendra modi when he was the general secretary of the bjp looking after prabhari for himachal pradesh and they had to form a government with shukram's party the haryana the himachal vikas uh, congress congress yeah. so lord shiva had also had to swallow the poison you know so i mean you were faced a situation like that so which is why the government i knew would not last i did not to last so less i, did, I thought last longer but it was brought down in 13 months which actually was a sign of the fact that the government had actually become cohesive and was working well and therefore at that moment they had to bring it down 
No, so just right. to uh, uh, ask one thing, if she wants to have your permission. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead, please go ahead. And so on that aspect of uh, you know one one aspect was managing coalition partners, uh, managing uh, managing the allies. The other aspect was the internal po- dynamics of the sun. Yeah. yeah. So as is well known now, I think uh, the initial choice of mm-hmm. finance minister in the second mm-hmm. NDA government, I think, or probably even in 1998, was uh, Jaswant Singh ji. Hmm. and then there is a kind of it's been reported that you know he was removed at the end tower and then yashwant sinha was brought in so how did uh, vajpayee ji manage those kind of contradictions those internal contradictions if i may ask you see the party had come to power but had not come to power on a strong wicket right 160 you know you were technically not ready for power in that sense you didn't have a well worked out uh, you know unlike uh, other countries which have good think tanks which develop policies and leaders lead the policies here unfortunately we don't have so it was still groping in the dark actually a lot has been made about uh, jaswant singh not being made a minister after being nominated as a minister i mentioned the book that there was somebody else also who was to be a minister was not made was pramod late pramod mahajan yeah. and the stand taken by one position and you can agree or disagree because the people who were talking to each other didn't talk to third persons about it and sure. they're both not around so we really it's conjecture but right. if i see that uh, both the names were removed from the list and both had just lost the parliamentary elections one from chitorgarh one from mumbai uh, northeast then is there a possible link to the fact that they just lost elections and the fact that slowly entered the raj sabha in six months nine months one year's time and then one by one both became ministers now it suggests obviously internal discussions within the sang parivar within the bjp because you know one has grown from the other their sure. linkage is very organic but individuals have their own opinions have their own experiences and uh, i think there has to be an element of give and take in that you know one can't be a purist or one can't be a completely like, i don't care for the other because you need each other you work with each other at the end of the day you are together you sink and swim together so there would be differences in that respect i think i should have been i should have been more alert to the fact that differences are common in good healthy organizations because the differences did not bring down the government this is what we must see the impact right. of it so in that sense yes there would there would there was tensions no doubt about it but i think as a retrospect i think there were healthy tensions understood right uh, so uh, another thing that you covered in the book uh, shakti ji is uh, you know how india's relationship with the us kind of tanked first after the pokhran yeah. test but it started blooming you know especially with yeah. the connect between jaswant singh ji and strobe talbert and you know you've talked about their meetings and so on uh, so what were what do you think were some of the key uh, turning points that resulted in this shift and you know how did this actually come about actually there are two books have gone into details strobe talbert's book himself has yeah. gone into a great detail about it it's a very good book i have been right in front of me engaging india Yes. and just one thing this book a call to honor you know they do see basically we were trying to explain to them that the world is changing cold war is over truly you are the dominant power therefore we have to work with you we want to work with you because of similar commonalities of interests and values and in the changing world where do you think india finds itself india faces a very peculiar situation where you think america china is the best partner we don't think so and in that process it took some time and as i mentioned earlier on in passing uh, there was section of the american establishment not the standard establishment okay the fringe element who actually were happy at india testing could they had already started seeing china as a potential long term threat to america you know so that definitely helped if i, I keep referring to the standard establishment line this is anti india at that stage a hangover the cold war days massively anti india at this stage to work with them was very difficult which means just one thing in trope child but i think met six or seven times while for himself in new york went out of the way to court america by calling it a natural ally and by saying that forget the past yes you have let us down but well, we may have let you down but we won't talk about it of course and you know let's get moving and that understanding that yes maybe the china pakistan relationship has more to it than will set will help the west that would have played the favor but it was painstaking hard work 
explaining our objective reality of two nuclear armed neighbors sitting on our head and on our territory right uh, so shakti ji uh, you know india also tried to mend relations with pakistan uh, vajpay ji went on the famous uh, lahore yes. bus ride uh, but at that point you know the trip was seen with a lot of skepticism on both sides and there is this fascinating part in the book where you talk about you know vajpay this statesman and how he makes the transition from being a politician to a statesman very skillfully so uh, can can you just talk about you know how that trip came about and uh, uh, and you know what exactly happened there uh, well of course partition had deeply hurt vajpay he had the poem about it very deeply hurt him but he also is to say you can't change you can change your friends but not your neighbors and therefore you have to find a solution to working with pakistan fortunately for him nawaz sharif at the helm also has started feeling after the previous dispute prime minister that if pakistan is to grow economically it must normalize not be friends it must normalize relations with india the nuclear thing was obviously a blow to that it was very very difficult to that but yet immediately after the sars summit at colombo where the two spent a lot of time with each other then in new york where initially they spent time and then we had a common lunch and they were working directly and indirectly through uh, track to diplomacy niaz naik from the pakistani side and mr arke mishra from the indian side and trying to see ki you know both of us want the same thing at the end of the day we want peace how do we have greater economic relations and that worked in that sense that the feeding that nawaz sharif mentioned in new york that i drove to delhi for the 82 asian games with my wife in a car from lahore and watched it back and people cross the border and therefore the idea of a bus trade comes out and then as a distinct literally a strong measure can mr vajpay travel in the bus so he invites mr vajpay vice chairman gupta's interview and then it ties up and mr vajpay just said yes i'm coming overruling the mea which wanted a formal invitation and we realized that this is no time for formality it was a huge political risk he paid a short term price as government fell partly because of the success of the pakistan trip i think it was well worth it had that risk not been taken india would not have been seen as such a responsible nuclear weapon spar one to the dehyphenation was required we are not pakistan is not our equivalent yes it's a it bothers us it says this terrorist kills our people does all that but we are not in the same league we have to tell the world we are not in the same league and therefore we are prepared to take the political risk fortunately for us as i said musharraf then it is criminal act with the kargil war to the act of the criminal it almost brought to nuclear weapon state on the edge brink but we were careful how to walk skate how to walk and thin ice and again the world saw us as different so i think that also to pakistan is really very important it failed in the sense of improving relations with pakistan that is bound to fail you cannot i in the foreseeable future cannot see pakistan the establishment of pakistan except normal see with india they require tensions with india otherwise they would not be able to soak up preempt so much of pakistan's social not just state resources not just budgetary resources but the lands and the all kinds of criminality that pakistani army does would not happen the normal see with the two countries you are bound to fail in that sense but in the larger sense you succeeded in telling the world we are different treat us differently right so uh, shakti sena ji uh, we have a follow up question uh, from ashish chandorkar on this uh, in the sense that uh, vajpay ji was you know personally very sincere he wanted good relations with pakistan uh, and you know his attempts were sort of met with treachery uh, multiple times uh, do you think at any point uh, this became like an overhang on the government and uh, vajpay ji personally no i don't think so pakistan was you know uh, if you remember you had the parliament attack and the mobilization of the parakraman which was huge humongous so it was no love for pakistan and then ultimately it was the sak summit in islamabad and of course in between you had the agra one also before the parliament attack yeah. now you had to consistently show that yes we will overcome obstacles because we want normalcy you know but 
after Parakram, it took a long time for things to come back to normal. I guess the Islamabad thing to me was uh, not an excess, but could have been done without. You know, I mean, it could have been done without. I guess there was some thinking that if we have good relations with Pakistan, it will impact the elections. This is my hunch in retrospect. I was not around. My book stops in 1999. I'm very clear about it. But yes, I'm a student of history and of contemporary politics. I can't shy away from Ashish's very relevant question. So I guess it was a part of that. But I still feel that uh, you had to show. I mean, you would not have been able to do Fulbama and Balakot had Prime Minister Modi not invited Nawaz Sharif to his ferrying in and had he not dropped into Lahore. You know, you had to demonstrate to the world, I am willing to take that extra risk to have normalcy. If the other side is not playing ball, then I shall violate, you know. So you had to do the step-by-step -step thing. So therefore, I think that was required to be done. Uh, Rajiv, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, no, actually, just picking up on that point, which uh, Shakti ji was mentioning about, you know, dehyphenation. So uh, I think I would just add that uh, economically in the 1990s, or in the definitely in the early 1990s, Pakistan was actually richer than India. Yeah, not many people realize. Yeah. Uh, and it was the reforms of 1991. Uh, then obviously the deepening of reforms by Vajpayee government starting in 1998, which actually helped India pull ahead. So, so you know, uh, when we in, today it sounds uh, kind of bizarre, right? That uh, no one speaks of it in the same breath. But you know, 20, 25 years ago, this was not really a yeah. done and dusted kind of idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, every question I'm asked outside India, even till as good as three years ago, was India, Pakistan. I think why Pakistan? I mean, why not Taiwan? Why, you know, why not Thailand? I mean, why Pakistan? You know? So, I mean, we had to do this to demonstrate that, you know, and the per capita income then surged. We went far ahead. All social indicators, we went ahead. So, it was required, I think, you know, to demonstrate. No, so, in that sense, the interplay between foreign policy and economic yeah. policy. I think I think that's borne out very well actually by the experience of last twenty years, and that should be highlighted, Rajiv. I think it's a very good point. That is something which yeah. we normally don't highlight because you know our economists don't think about foreign policy, and foreign policy people are completely clueless for the economy. Other than think we should be strong, we should grow. Now India should grow has no meaning to. What does it mean in a concrete terms? Yeah. You know, so we need a convergence of thinking in that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, great, great points, uh, Rajiv and uh, Shakti ji. Uh, so Shakti ji, uh, you know, there were a lot of crises, right? Uh, in the, in that one year uh, that <laughs> Vajpayee ji was in government. I think that's probably an understatement uh, of sorts. <laughs> you know, we had sanctions, we had a difficult economy, difficult allies. The list is very wrong, uh, very long. So uh, at any point, uh, you know, did uh, Vajpayee ji ever, you know, lose his cool or feel despondent uh, considering all the obstacles that he had to face? Very good one. That's a very good one, uh, Shavatsa. You know, I would think that obviously there were frustrations all around, very regularly. But there were highs also, the small highs, you know. So there were, uh, when you meet people, when you do some economic policy changes, etc. The pressure on the change in the telecom policy happening, the highways program, the uh, inauguration of Konkan Railway, which had no role to play, which was already being built, but it's all right. You know, so, and in one sense, Mr. Vajpayee had prepared himself for power for about 30, 40 years, you know. So in that sense, he also knew how brittle power could be. I mean, Janta Party comes to power at 300 plus seats. And what happens? It lasts two years and four months, you know. So, Rajiv Gandhi comes to power with 415 and within a year and a half he's already floundering, you know. So I guess, though, when personally you lose power, it hurts you hard, it hits you very hard. But the ability to bounce back is something I found amazing, you know. I mean, that sense of balance that, okay, we are out, we are out, you know. Yeah. The ability to then laugh, you know. So there were crises many times. He looked pulled down initially a lot. In fact, in the months of, say, July, August, uh, till early September, of 98, he looked really pulled down. He didn't look very sluggish. And then he managed to pick up the pieces and built on it, all the while having a majority which could go any day, you know? So 
in that sense, I write that his government never got the honeymoon period that U.S. presidents get of 100 days. He didn't get it for one day, not even for a day, you know. So it, in that sense, it was unfair. It was very unfair to him. But that's how Indian politics is. Right. Uh, so just, just one thing, Shiva. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Rajiv. Uh, so, so actually, uh, you mentioned uh, Shakti Ji that you know, in the I guess the common program which was made, mm -hmm. uh, BJP had to agree to set aside all these four demands. Yeah, you know, something they three demands. Three demands. Years. Yes, the UCC, the Ram Janma Bhumi uh, matter, and Six Article Three Seventy. Yeah, so they agreed to set it aside, and obviously, you know, uh, uh, figures like. Vajpayee ji, Advani ji, they had pretty much all their lives actually uh, fought for these issues. Yeah. So at a personal level, it may have been very difficult for them to decide that, you know, we drop yeah. this to move ahead. So, uh, so I mean, my question mm -hmm. would be, you know, how, uh, I mean, how did they sort of deal with that? Because, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost like, you know, you get to sort of, uh, you, you win the prize, but you don't really win the prize. Yeah. Uh, and they, they could justify it which Mr. Vajpayee said in parliament, he's saying, we have not dropped this demand. They are not our hidden agenda. He said, they are our agenda. They're not hidden, it, he said. He said, we lack the numbers. You know? Right. And uh, see, Ram Janabhumi was a kind of thing, came late, you know. But the Article 370 was very yes. core to their, and, and the Uniform Civil Code, yeah. which yes. is there in your uh, constitution, which is there in the activist of state policy. And Vajpayee started his political career in Kashmir by accompanying Shamsan yes. Mukherjee very dear to him. But by then, and give credit to the present government, by then the feeling was that much as we hate Article 370, there is no legal way to do away with it because the Confederate Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir does not exist anymore. To kind of a, that was more or less convinced that this would never happen, you know. So while we'll raise the demand, they wanted Ram Janabhumi Temple built through negotiations. Chandrasekhar was fairly advanced in the negotiations. It failed. Then his government was brought down. And again, they realized that in Indian society, Article 3, United Infirm Civil Code still didn't have the results that it needed. Policy still doesn't have it. And therefore, they said, we, we'll, for the time being, lacking numbers, where is our option? You know? Right. Right. A uh, couple of uh, audience questions, uh, Shakti ji. Yes. Uh, one is, uh, could you share light on uh, Vajpayee ji and his ways of uh, handling criticism from media and opposition? Uh, any interesting anecdotes? Uh, this question has been asked by Siddharth Raman. <laughs> that, I don't have any anecdotes anymore. One, of course, you know, that while I've, I've kept track of the general developments those days, I was not, and I, don't, I will not trust my memory. After 22 years, I will not trust my memory. Because I've seen in some recent books, pretty nonsensical things being said by people who knew better, you know. But uh, he was comfortable with criticism being in public life all his life, being a minority of public opinion, you know. When the Janasang was growing, it was not the mainstream of Indian politics. It was not even the mainstream of Indian academia or the media thinking. So they were used to swimming against the tide throughout. So in that sense, it helped them cope with criticism because they were being ridiculed most of the time. I mean, he said, we were not given a chance to speak in parliament, only four of us, yeah. 57 backbenchers. So I had to repeatedly walk out of the house even to press my point till he started being noticed. And parliament has a fair system. If you're four out of 520, your speaking time in any debate is proportional to that. Four out of 20 means less than 1% of the time. So there were, ultimately, he got more time than 1%, much more time. So he was used to living in a situation where his was a lonely voice, and he would be attacked and criticized. Debate in the late 50s, when Jansang was four people, and the CPI, Bhupesh Gupta, tore into the Jansang. He said, are you anti-Congress or anti-me? You know, I had to tell him that. You know? So I guess they were used to criticism. They didn't let it worry them too much. They used to read them very carefully. He used to read the newspapers, critical articles, very, very carefully. If that's an anecdote, yes, he used to read them very carefully. Right. But uh, Sadat, don't get it from me. You will not get any piece of gossip. From me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of the things in the book is that while you have you know, shared a lot, I think what you have not shared shows a lot of responsibility, you know, with respect to how you treated your position. So in that sense, it's a great book. 
ट so so uh, whom did atal ji sort of get a, get you know if he if he had a doubt if he had a if he wanted to get a second opinion <laughs> where did he turn to very good part one of course you know he became literally the number one of the jansang by 1968 yes yeah and for the next 15 years he was the number one of the jansang or the bjp or the setup clearly the number one by a mile you know in fact when the janta party government was formed the first time advani ji came the public eye So he was then in the Delhi Municipal Metropolitan Body as the chairman of the body, etc. And uh, so he was never in. Then he became the information, and that too he became the information broadcasting minister. Yes. But people liked him for his book. His prisoner scrap book came out. That brought him in the public eye a lot. So he was actually was the number one by a long shot. Then Mr. Va- of course, in, by the mid eighties, actually Mr. Advani then became. उंडी Then he's also met a lot of other people from the media and otherwise who used to talk to people from the strategic community. Many of them could meet him, and he was very comfortable meeting them and listening to them. So he did have a very wide variety of uh, sources on which to bounce ideas off, and more importantly, a recipient of their ideas. You know, so that really helped him grow. That really helped him understand things better. You know, very open to ideas. Very interesting. Which is why uh, he read the newspapers very carefully. especially the criticisms you know he was very comfortable reading it uh we have a question from roshan and i think uh, i would want to hear both of your perspective on this uh so shakti ji i'll come to you first uh, what's your perspective on you know vajpayee ji as the poet slash statesman versus the politician uh you know poet is important But uh, I spent spend most of my life in politics, and what I find, and one of the reasons again I wrote the book, is to explain the political journey also. Very important to understand. Yeah. So as I've written again in the book, we who speak English in India, I speak both. Of course, Hindi also I speak, and I follow five other Indian languages. But leaving it aside, my academic background is in English. My reading is now ninety-five percent English. Uh, we tend to. Underestimate the difficulties of politicians. We tend to underestimate the journeys. We tend to understand their qualities and their abilities to move on. You know, we really underestimate them. You must understand it. And Vajpayee was a very successful politician. But I would argue that if I look at the period 1950, with Patel's death, till 2004, this 54-year period, if I have to look to 50-year period, if I look to, I would see two successful politicians, huh? really successful: Vajpayee, Nehru. Nehru again tremendously underestimated statesman idealist. I mean the cold way Nehru eliminated all his political rivals in the Congress Party, the way he bamboozled his ideas, overriding the party, amazing. But again, we think of it as an idealist. So Vajpayee was a poet, a very sensitive poet. Thank God for that. But he was also a politician who came from a party, no background, family background, sense of a lower middle class family background. No godfather in politics, becomes an MP, four MP, goes to ten MPs, go to thirty MPs, down to two MPs. Yeah. If you from there become prime minister of India, you understand Indian politics and Indian society. The two go together. His ability to vibe with the people of India across the country. I remember we were traveling through the Mopla areas of Kerala. Thousands of Mopla women were on the road to greet him. None of them would vote for BJP. They were there on the road to greet him. you know so that ability to vibe with the people was very very important so i would not rush and draw a distinction too much distinction between the politician and the statesman the distinction comes in and okay you have a point 
is that when you say ki i leave the electoral things aside i will do this because it is right for me that is important that is important and he could do that at different times he can do it if you do it every time you won't be in politics anymore but the politician him was strong as he says politics is something i can neither fully swallow nor can i throw it na nigal sakte na ugal sakte you know so that is a kind of uh, relationship with politics he had over to rajiv for a, for a younger and a fresher perspective <laughs> yeah no so i think i think that's a fabulous perspective and uh, i mean so much to learn also from the side that you are talking about right uh, so i'll i'll come to the uh, last question of today's podcast it's been a really fascinating you know talking to both uh, you and rajiv and hearing your perspectives uh so this is a question outside your book shakti ji and it's outside that uh, period you talk about but uh, but you mentioned you are a student of history so i'll ask you this question so uh, in your perspective uh, you know why couldn't the vajpayee government return to power uh, what do you think were the reasons uh, that you know they they missed out one of course you know there's an american saying politics is all local and i was asked this question in an interview by swaraj the other day and of course the suggestion there was that had vajpayee taken an aggressive attitude towards pakistan as mr modi has done maybe would have won the election very good thought thought as the point of view, very good thought and not thought of it earlier on so i really tamil nadu the dmk bjp alliance in 99 got 25 seats the admk bjp alliance in 2004 got zero seats at one of pondicherry So you are simply down from twenty-five seats to zero seats. That's twenty-five seats minus. Andhra Pradesh, the BJP TDP seats in two thousand and ninety-nine and two thousand and four again see the difference. You lost twenty twenty-five seats there. Forty forty-five seats you lost in these two states. Bihar Jharkhand, Bihar was one in ninety-nine, two thousand and four Bihar Jharkhand, same number of votes, but the option came together. You again fell from thirty plus seats. So about eight to ten seats, twenty seats more gone, and the implosion of the BJP in the UP, Kalyan Singh, non-Kalyan Singh, people with Vajpayee, people attacking Vajpayee, the UP BJP was such a vibrant party. Nineteen hundred eight had fallen to twenty-nine after being fifty plus in three elections. Two thousand four, they fell from twenty-nine to ten seats. That's twenty yeah. more seats. Eighty seats lost in these four states. Nothing was shining Bharat. Nothing was shining in it at all. Could it have been different? Maybe the choice of alliance in Tamil Nadu, at that stage, looked inspired. Turned out to be a disaster. Naidu, I have always argued, had would have lost the nineteen elections, but for the BJP transferred votes, and well, it didn't. It, by that two thousand four, it was over. So both of them got such a beating that it taken the BJP so long to recover in say Andhra Pradesh, coastal Andhra. Where in '98 they won three seats on their own. In '98 they had won three seats. So you know there are a lot of factors, and therefore this idea of shining India. I mean, rural areas, BJP by and large did better. Urban areas, Delhi seven seats, six they lost. Bombay seats lost. So they were losing seats in urban areas. Bangalore, Bangalore seats lost. Not in rural areas so much. So it's a complex. It would have been uh, good for history had he won the election 2004. Yeah. But you can't choose. If it does not align with that choice, yeah, Rajiv, uh, if I could get your thoughts also on this, uh, I know you've spoken on this earlier. No, I mean it's one of the great what ifs, right? So, uh, yeah. had we seen a continuation of the, as uh, Shakti ji was saying, the classical liberal economic ideas that the NDA one had pushed in all those domains, all those sectors, and you know, continuation of that kind of foreign policy, it's one of the great what ifs actually. Uh, Uh, how india would be today i think probably a very different orbit already with five more years of a government like that and and, and i i share, share the analysis actually that i think it is spot on that it is far more locally driven than people tend to uh realize because obviously that sweeping uh, sort of narrative is more uh, appealing somewhere It's also lazy. Sweeping narrative yes. is not only lazy. Yes. <laughs> Simplistic sort of view is that oh, it was India shining and that's why they lost. Well, not really. Yeah. 
No, I give specific examples. Please yeah, get yeah. my interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So uh, that brings us to the end of a fascinating podcast. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you, Rajiv, uh, and uh, thank you, Shakti ji. Uh, if you like this podcast, do subscribe uh, and share uh, with family and friends. Uh, we are available on YouTube and all leading podcast platforms. Uh, we'll be back soon with more interesting episodes, book reviews, and so on. Uh, for your back, I want to say thank you. I want to sure, say sure. thank you. Both also, many congratulations sure. to you for uh, this great book. And uh, it's a terrific thank contribution. And related contribution to you for your book. Thank you so much, sir. Thank right. you. Right. Absolutely. But so, Srivatsa, thank you very much. Pleasure talking you. to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Shakti ji. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, thank so you. Till we, till we meet again, uh, stay safe and Jai Hind. Namaskar.